Seems as last week's tier list went down so well. I thought I'd do another quick smaller one, seems as I have a few extra minutes today. This time I'll be ranking all the published work related to A Song of Ice and Fire. So this is really going to be a focus on the books. When it comes to things like short stories and novellas, if there's a collection of them together, that's what I'll be using to rank. The obvious place to start, of course, is the first book, A Game of Thrones. On balance, it's definitely one of the stronger books from start to finish for me. I can't really think of any really slow chapters or anything I would really skip. I can forgive it for being a little slow in places as it is an introduction to the story and thus things really needed to be set up. It's also the only book with Ned as a POV and of course you have Robert Baratheon and I love reading their dynamic. Also you have all the Tower of Joy stuff. For me that's such an important part of the story. So I think it's be fair to put Game of Thrones in A. A Clash of Kings. Now, A Clash of Kings is a solid follow-up with some new POVs such as Davos and some great storylines such as Stannis being introduced. For me, it's just as good as the first book. However, what I can say this time is there are some chapters I don't look forward to when rereading. And for me, they just miss the mark a little bit, most notably Sam and the early Arya chapters. The Battle of the Blackwater is a great read and it's really interesting getting into the psychology of all the characters and the different perspectives of the battle. The extra time given to Jon's trip with Corrin Halfhand is a nice perk as well. I really think the show missed this. So for Clash of Kings, I'm going to put it as a solid B. Next up, we have A Storm of Swords. Now, I know for me, and I know for many, A Storm of Swords is people's favourite book. Yes, it's very, very long. But I loved every second of it. I mean, in the UK, it had to be split into two separate volumes. You have so much going on. And of course, The Red Wedding and my personal favourite part, The Battle for the Wall. I think what really helps it, in my view, is it almost feels like two books in one. And I guess that is helped a little bit by the UK version being split into two volumes. With the first ending just after The Red Wedding. Plus, you have some great POVs added, such as Jamie. So for me, this book is a solid it really has to be the S tier. And I think it, it also shows a lot that it coincides with probably the best years of the show as well. Now we get to A Feast for Crows. And I think we do have some problems here. In the timeline, A Feast for Crows and A Dance of Dragons happen at the same time roughly. However, they're split by location. I think the problem with A Feast for Crows, it drew a short straw here with a hell of a lot of new POVs added and almost feeling like the first in a new series of books completely which means there's a lot of set up in there, like the Dornish plot and the Ironborn plot. As good as those plots are, it almost did feel like I'm back to the beginning. However, what it, I will say is some of the POVs that were added are absolutely fantastic. Like Cersei is brilliant. Um, Ariane Martel is fantastic. However, I do understand why a lot of people the first time they read it feel a little bit overwhelmed. Um, for my tastes, I think it's a little bit slow in some places. Um, a lot of traveling about and with not necessarily a lot happening. A lot of Brianne's chapters here. So for that reason, it's still a good book. It's not the best, it's not the worst. I, I think it's a, a fair C. Now we get to the last of the main books, um, A Dance with Dragons. Now, this is the other side of the coin to A Feast of Crows. In this, we have a lot more of the characters we know there is still a lot of new characters like John Connington, who I absolutely love. But in it, we have Danny coming back. We have John coming back. Really, there's a lot going on. I personally really enjoyed Tyrion's journey in Essos. I thought that was fantastic because we really learn a lot about the world. It introduces more new plot lines like John Connington and the, the idea of Aegon being alive or perhaps Aegon being a black fire. Still think it has some of the issues with pacing and, and a lot of new elements being introduced that Feast of Crows has. But I think because we have a lot more established characters, it handles it a lot better. The ending is absolutely fantastic. A Dance with Dragons for me feels very much like the setup for Winds of Winter. I enjoyed it more than Clash of Kings, but not as much as A Storm of Swords. So I think it's probably, I say high B, a low A. I think I'm probably gonna put it in an A. Now we're kind of getting to the extended universe, if you wanna call it, stuff like that. The Lands of Ice and Fire is an interesting book. I wouldn't necessarily say it's full of new information. And I think it's definitely an acquired taste. I personally, really love maps and stuff like that. I remember when the, the Lord of the Rings films came out, I was given, not the Silmarillion, but it was like a, 
or a picture book with loads loads of art from Lord of the Rings and loads of really detailed maps and it fascinated me and for me it is a bit like that and obviously if you watch my channel for a long time you will clearly recognize the maps from this because these are the maps I used for maybe the first 10 videos on my channel before I spent the time and really made my own but I think it's one of these things where where it's not necessarily lots of new information and it is an acquired taste for me it's probably d i was a little bit iron and whether to even put this in here but my logic was i remember when it came out i saw adverts for it everywhere like every bus stop i walked past had an advert for it on and it was just as the show was really peaking in popularity and i think it was really aimed at people who hadn't read the books but wanted someone to jump in and i did buy it just to see what it was like but for me, having read it, it was just a, it is just a collection really of the, of the Tyrion chapters. And if you've read Game of Thrones, you read this. Looking at it from someone who's never read the books, just watch the show, and this is the first thing you read. I don't think it does a good job. By the time you get towards the end, it's diverted from the show so much. People and there's so many characters that are in the book that aren't in the show. If you haven't read the books before, you're gonna have no idea what's going on or who they are. So for that reason, I'm probably gonna put it down in probably E because the thing is I can I can see its purpose, but it just wasn't for me. A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms. This is the um, collection of the Duncan Egg short stories. Only three of them and it's really not a very long read. And if you've not read it yet, I really recommend you do. I actually really recommend, instead of buying the book, actually um, getting the audiobook from Audible or something. It's narrated by Harry Lloyd, who played Viserys Targaryen in the show. And he does an absolutely fantastic job. After Roy Detrice's death, I really hope they get him to do Windsor Winter and Dream of Spring. And maybe even go back and do the other Game of Thrones book, because really, it's one of the better audiobooks I've listened to. But having read it and listened to it, it's such an interesting story because it takes place in such an interesting part of history. Just before the reign of kind of like the last few Targaryen kings, it's during the Blackfyre Rebellions, which is really interesting. And for me, it's really interesting, completely different look at the world through the eyes of a hedge knight. And I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. I think one day, I really hope George R. R. Martin can just get the main series done and finish Duncan Egg as well because it's interesting because we already know how the story ends the whole incident at Summerhall if you take one thing away from this video it's read this read this book because I suspect one day probably be brought to screen for me Dun Duncan Egg is an absolutely fantastic book um I would put it in a the problem for me is it is only three short stories it's not a complete story from start to finish yet so because of that and because of the length i am going to put it in b but i really do want to put it in a and i really hope we do get to see we do get to see at least two more little short stories because i know there's definitely going to be one where they go to winterfell and that'd be i think that'd be absolutely fantastic next up we have oh the worlds of ice and fire very similar to the lands of ice and fire where it's a very acquired taste if you're going to read this you what i call a really a proper fan in a way it's kind of george R. R. martin's cimmerillion it gives you details about the world that are never going to appear in the main books never going to appear in any tv show in any way it covers really the entire history of the world from the first men the andal invasion to old valyria to the roinar and namiria's ships and even little things like the unique cultures of each of the seven kingdoms and the customs and the history and it even covers a lot of Essos. And you find out about places like Yeti and Ashai. And it's truly amazing the scale of the world. You find out a lot about like wildlife as well. Like how in in Sotholios you have wyverns. Which people often mistake for dragons. And people actually craft a lot of theories from this book. Like the idea that dragons are actually a hybrid created by Valyrians. Things like that. It's really fascinating. What's interesting is written from the... the point of view of maesters of the citadel so when they talk about these far off places it's reports and what other people and it's like a second hand it's one of these ones where it's a really good reference book to have on your coffee table but if you just want to sit down for half an hour and read something quick it's great to pick up just have a little read you don't even have to read it in order just have a quick browse um i'm probably going to put it in c and i think really what's holding it back for me is it's not solely written by george R. R. martin but two of his friends as well 
the working of notes George gave them, and it is all considered canon. I think for that reason, I can't really warrant putting it higher than a C. Lastly, Fire and Blood. Now, Fire and Blood's an incredibly important book to me because it's really what inspired me to make this channel. Because I know there are people out there who absolutely love the lore and history of World of Ice and Fire, but really don't have the time to commit to reading it. The aim of the channel was to take the information from the World of Ice and Fire and Fire and Blood and condense them down into maybe ideally 10 minute videos you can just watch on the way to work or while you're making dinner or something like that. But, but Fire and Blood charts the history of the Targaryens from Aegon the Conqueror all the way to Aegon the Third. It gives you an incredible amount of detail. All the kings, all the Targaryen royal family. It covers events such as the Dance of Dragons. Aegon's conquest and his relationship with his sisters is fantastic. Learning about his sons is fantastic. Then you've got people like Jaehaerys, who really is one of the most important kings in the entire story. Because I think without Jaehaerys, the Targaryens would have fallen a lot quicker than they did. Now... A lot of people criticise this book for recycling a lot from The World of Ice and Fire. And that is true. Much of Aegon's conquest into Aenys and Maegor was in The World of Ice and Fire. There was a little bit of added additional stuff in it. However, there's so much more there that isn't. And I can kind of forgive it that a little bit. Typical George. It was meant to be one book. But it looks like we're probably going to get a second volume dealing from the end of... Aegon the Third, all the way to Robert's Rebellion. As much as I want to put it in S, I have to really put it in in A because because of the recycled stuff from One of Ice and Fire and the fact that perhaps it's not complete. You're kind of missing half the story, if you know what I mean. I think I'm quite happy with that. I mean, I don't necessarily see too many really hot takes in in there. I maybe I could put Duncan Egg higher. Maybe I know a lot of people put. Fire and Blood a lot lower, but for me that's personal reasons. I'll be interesting to see what other people think of this. So let me know down in the comments, like and subscribe the video. If this tier list does as well as last week's one did, if I've got time, I'll do next week as well.